you for that wonderful music, Brack. Buenos dias, good morning, bienvenidos. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Rochester. We are so happy that you are here with us this morning. Here at First Unitarian, our mission is through spiritual connection and community. We listen deeply to others and ourselves. We open to wonder and transformation, and we serve with love and humility. I have two announcements today, one very important. The first is that we'll be having our connection and conversation at, um, time after service today, as usual, so please stay to connect. Um, and the second is that we are having a, our wonderful Pride Carnival this Friday from 6.30 until 8.30. We will have games, prizes. I believe we will also have some guests walking around our church grounds. So please come on over to 220 um, Winton Road and join us in having a wonderful celebration of Pride and our LGBTQ plus community and allies. I'm Shannon Foos, membership coordinator, and leading worship today are a wonderful group of folks. We have Tommy Snell, Brock, Elizabeth Krika. I have the honor of introducing Reverend AJ Van Tyne, our new assistant minister. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy that you're here today. And we also have Reverend Mariela um, Perez Simons. She was with us last week. Mariela is a Cuban American UU minister focusing on eco spirituality, eco feminism, and religious naturalism. She's the producer of the weekly show, The Seed, The Soil, and The Soul. Reverend Mariela describes herself as an eco spiritual maestra, which means teacher, and minister. She's an advocate for the human soul and the creatress of the weekly show on embodiment, spirituality, nature, healing, and justice. We are so happy to have Reverend Mariela with us again today. Behind the scenes, as you all know, we have a wonderful group of hospitality folks and ushers making sure things come together, that we are safe, that we have this wonderful time here. We also have on hand a chat chaplain, John Farrell, who is available. If you're worrying about yourself or someone else, please feel free to reach out to him in the chat. Now, let us all take a deep breath together. As we settle into the sacred time and place. And please join me in saying our chalice lighting words. May the flame we now kindle inspire us to use our power to heal with love, to help with compassion, to bless with joy, and to seek liberation in the fullness of community. Good morning. I am Reverend AJ Van Tyne, and I am so excited to finally be here with you all. And I'm glad to be in worship with you this morning. Having just moved across country and into our new home, I found myself speaking with a contractor in the house earlier this week as my wife and I scrambled to get our house settled, or continuing to scramble. And although this contractor and I had the task at hand, this inspection, he and I slowly developed a rapport as he did his inspecting, just beginning with the basic generalities. But at one point, I mentioned something about my sibling, and that caught his attention. So he asked if I if how I said that, what I said my sibling, meant that my sibling was non-binary, which got us talking about the expanding gender norms in our modern society today. Although he, was, he did not use the phrase non-binary as I had to explain some of that terminology to him. And so we ended up talking about a range of topics, including religion, world affairs, feminism, racial justice, and of course, gender expansiveness. I discovered that although we used different language to get there, we were mostly on the same page about the essential values that really mattered to us. And what mattered even more than that was that we were taking the time to have a conversation, to build some understanding and relationship between our two different social locations and our lived experiences. And isn't that why we come to church? Because here at First Unitarian, we believe in the power of human relationship. 
that by listening to one another and being open to finding inspiration and connection, wherever and whoever it may come from, we can grow our spirit and build our engagement with the world. I invite you now to rise in voice, body, and spirit as we join in singing together, Wake Now My Senses. now into the spiritual practice of generosity. Each week we split our plate collection with organizations that share our values and lead us to the work of justice and compassion in our community. This week we share our offering with Citizens Climate Lobby, a non-for-profit, non-partisan, grassroots advocacy organization focused on national policies to address climate change. Citizens Lobby works toward the adoption of fair, effective, and sustainable climate change solutions by empowering people to work in keeping with the concerns of their local communities. As a deliberate nonpartisan effort, CCL builds upon shared values rather than partisan divides in order to create a broad, sustainable foundation for climate action across all geographic regions and political inclinations. There are many ways to give, as you all know, including Venmo and Simple Church. Please give generously to support the work and witness of First Unitarian Church and Citizens Climate Lobby. <laughs> Thank you. 
Beloved, I invite you now to a moment of prayer. I see prayer as a place of refuge, a place of respite, a container that we create during our days, throughout our days, where we can come to find a little bit of comfort, a little bit of calm and sustenance and strength to keep on going with the world, with the work that there needs to be done in this world. So much work, so much suffering, and so we come here seeking a little bit of respite from the day-to-day -day life. And so I invite you to take a posture of prayer, an inner posture of prayer mainly, however you express it hourly is up to you, but an inner posture of reverence and prayer, and you come to what is most sacred. We call on collectively to what is most sacred. We say, spirit of life, source of love, great beauty, creativity of the cosmos, Mother Earth, sacred mother, God of our understanding, we come to you with broken hearts. We come to you with souls that are weary to the bone. We come to you with our own suffering and the suffering of our community and the suffering of our world. And sometimes it feels like so much, like we can bear the pain of the world but we come to this moment of prayer to you, which we understand as, as most sacred. And we place our troubles at your feet. And we give our gratitude for this life, our gratitude for everything that is working and everything that is beautiful in this world everything that is working and everything that is beautiful around us. And we come here and we give thanks for that. And in this moment of prayer, there is no right or wrong. We bring, we bring it all. We bring our suffering. We bring our gratitude. We bring our joy. And we place it on the altar. And we also bring our silence because sometimes we have no words. All we have, all we need is a moment of silence, a quiet moment in a world that is so loud, so loud for our souls. And so I invite you now to 30 seconds of silence where we can breathe and just be 30 seconds.
We are grateful for this refuge. We are grateful for this community. We are grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful. I was 17 years old and in my first year of college in the beautiful city that was Havana City, I had grown up in a small town and I had spent most of my adolescence and teenage years working in the fields away in the country. But now in the big city, things were different. I was exposed to theater, to poetry, to the arts. And for the first time, I was having a taste of liberation since I was no longer forced to work in the fields for hours, hours each day, as was the case during my middle and high school years. I was now also considered an adult living in the city away from my family. So for the first time, it felt as if I was holding in my hands both my own clock and my own compass, which meant that I had control over my time and my days and that I was able to follow my own interest, my own inner guidance. And so I signed up for a drama class where I discovered the work of the Spanish writer and playwright and poet Federico Garcia Lorca. And it was through his play, La Casa de Bernarda Alba, The House of Bernarda Alba, that I found something deeply primal and real and authentic about who I was as an individual and as a human being. Lorca gave words 
to something I had always known, but that only Lorca, with his mastery of language and his understanding of human, human emotions, could put into words, could capture with such beautiful language and story. The play is set in the 1930s in Andalusia, Spain, and it revolves around a domineering mother who, after the death of her second husband, forces her five daughters to eight years of mourning inside the house. For eight years, the girls would have no access to fresh air, to colors, to music, to lovers, to friends. La Casa de Bernarda Alba is all about the anguish one feels under oppression, about the catastrophic effects of having to repress one's personhood and one's passions, and about the violence of certain social and cultural norms. Most people read the play and they feel what the characters were feeling, trapped inside that dark, dusty house. But I felt these concepts at a much deeper level because I had to play the role of one of the sisters, which meant that I had to deeply feel what she was feeling in order for me to act. And so in that embodiment, something shifted in me. I began to see how that had been my whole life, having been raised under similar conditions, having been born and raised under a dictatorship, a dictator who ruled over our lives, who forced children like me to work in the fields, who banned certain books, who kept us in that island, who limited our expressions and our rights to grow, to expand, to evolve, to express ourselves. I had never understood that until then. I had no way of knowing, because think about this. We lived on an island. There was no internet to connect us to the rest of the world, to tell us that other forms of government, other forms of life were possible. If you were privileged enough to have a TV, the channels were run by the government and so were the newspapers and the magazines. And, and the few books we had access to were, were quite limited, that the selection was quite limited. So my generation and I, we grew up loving, adoring, worshipping our oppressor. We were the first generation born after Castro came into power and we were fully educated under that system. Not all of it was bad, of course, but I had never understood oppression until Lorca made me see it. Because again, his understanding of the human psyche and because of the mastery, his mastery of the human emotions and language. Acting in that play, having to embody those concepts again, I began to understand oppression and how it forces us to repress parts of our personhood, parts of our humanity, our natural instincts. Like the women in the play who felt suffocated, I began to feel suffocated as well. That was a big year for me. 17 was a big year for me. I had so much life inside of me. I had so many ideas in my head. I felt I could burst. There was so much I wanted to share with the world, but I didn't have a voice to express it. In fact, some days I didn't even have a piece of paper or a pen or pencil to write those ideas down because poverty is devastating like that. These days living in the United States as a middle-class person, I have the privilege of having a notebook in every room in my house and in my purse and in my car, because the way my brain works with the ideas coming so quickly is painful when I can capture them. But as a poor teenager in Cuba, oftentimes I didn't have a single piece of paper or pen or pencil to write down the ideas and it was agonizing, agonizing. But the worst part really was that I felt that I didn't have a voice to express myself. It would take me decades in order to free my voice and my duende as well. I'll tell you about duende in a moment because guess who helped me with that? It was Lorca. 
I was already living in the United States when I discovered his essay, Play and Theory of Duende, where he talks about this concept of a human expression that he called Duende. It seemed to me that Lorca knew both oppression and repression. He was a gay man living in a suffocatingly homophobic society in Spain in the early 1900s. And he was also an outspoken liberal living on the right wing forces that would eventually take his life at the short age of 38. He was one of the most expressive souls I have ever encountered. And he felt still limited by the oppressive social norms of his time. Lorca was individual, an individual who felt deeply and who valued expression deeply. He was a poet, a pianist, a composer, a playwright, a theater director, and so on and so forth. And this passion led him to explore that subject of human expression in the essay and lecture, Play and Theory of Duende, Lorca writes about something he noticed in the expression of flamenco musicians, something he called duende or el, or el duende. Duende is a concept similar to that of the genius in ancient Rome, where people believed that every house or person had a guiding spirit that they called genius. Similarly, in Southern Spain and in some parts of Latin America, El duende is understood as dueño de la casa or duende casa, which means possessor of the house. In the essay then, Lorca articulates a theory of self-expression that goes beyond technique. It's about authentic, real emotion. It's about emotional truth. It's not simply acting. It's not acting or performing. Duende happens when, when the performer is able to get in touch with something within themselves, something deeply human, but also transcendent. Lorca said that in flamenco performances, the audiences wait for the moment when el duende appears and they say, ole, 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 which is derived from Allah, Allah, the term for God in Islam because the Moors had reigned over that part of Southern Spain for centuries and the word Allah had morphed into Olé. Duende is the kind of art that gives you goosebumps, goosebumps. The Mexican-American writer Clarissa Pincola Estes says that in Latin American folklore, a storyteller is often called the trans teller. She says, and I quote, the storyteller calls on El Duende, the wind that blows soul into the faces of listeners. Isn't that beautiful? El Duende is the wind that blows soul into the faces of the listeners. There is something that feels sacred, transcendent, and universal in the honest, unrepressed emotions of human beings. It moves us to the core because we recognize it as true inside ourselves. Technique doesn't do that. Duende often emerges and you go into a state of flow, something that has been researched for decades now in the Western world, that state of flow. Duende is authentic self-expression that has an impact on the lives of others. Like Lorca's Duende has helped me liberate myself and my Duende and free my Duende for decades now. Duendes do that. Duende helps us connect to our soul as well. And it helps others connect to their souls as well. A piece of art that moves us to our core. We feel it. But by soul, I mean the core of our being, the most whole part of ourselves, not broken parts of ourselves, not a shame part of ourselves, but whole. 
And I believe that many of us have this longing, this longing to express ourselves unapologetically, to share from our inner beauty, to feel connected to our soul, to our core. And while I believe that Lorca's Duende was more about the arts and culture, I find Duende in every field, from sports to science. Lorca described Duende as a mysterious force that everyone feels and no philosopher has been able to explain. Duende is one of those concepts that are ineffable which means hard to put into words, like the concept of God or soul. Wikipedia actually has a pretty decent interpretation of duende. Let's look at it. Duende or tener duende, to have duende, is a Spanish term for a heightened state of emotion, expression and authenticity, often connected with flamenco. But I, as I said before, from my personal interpretation of duende, Duende can be found in almost any human endeavor, from arts to science, to business, to politics and technology. People who have been able to harness the power of their duende have been so admired by the rest of us that we have been uplifting them and giving them awards for ages. Right now, somewhere on this planet, be it in the world of film or science or music or sports, an award ceremony is happening Right now, someone's genius is being celebrated. That's how much we admire Duende. We all have Duende, this thing inside of us that wants to be expressed through us, something that when not repressed, emerges naturally, like a life force inside of us, or like this ancestral DNA blueprint that we need to live in order to feel authentic or our unrepressed humanity, full humanity. For some of us, this feels like a calling, a mysterious pull from the distance. Others feel it like a longing or a yearning. Sometimes I think of it as the call of evolution. Other times I think of it as the longing to be free, the longing to be fully free to live according to our own nature. And sometimes I see it as the creativity of the cosmos that created the world and continues to create through us if we're open to it. I have been a student of this life force for decades now, and I felt so validated years later when I read this quote from the renowned choreographer and dancer and dance instructor, Martha Graham who seem to have been fascinated by this life force as well. She says, there is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And since there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and it will be lost. The world will not have it. That's devastating. This is what I began to understand at age 17, slowly. That when that life force is truncated, when that natural expression is held captive or is forced into obedience, it causes havoc in our lives and in our nervous systems. Clarissa Pincola Estes has a different interpretation of Duende. It's pretty fabulous. Here are some excerpts from her book, The Creative Fire. At the center of the psyche, there is a mystical substance that in Spanish is called el duende, the creative function. It is the awe of life, the animating engine. And it's more than animation, it's a way of living that is following all the shapes and the curves of the lay of the land of your psyche. El duende is behind the instinctual nature, is the breath of the self, the oxygenating system that supports created life. This unseen force, she says, can fill people with God, can fill people with fierce words that can cut to the bone or can cut to the center of the issue or can fill them with words that can heal or fly like a shaman's drum. 
This is the center of the psyche. She continues, it cannot be extracted or taken out like a lo loaf of bread, nor it can be put in as one puts food in one's mouth. It's a being, it comes to roost or to visit those who make a place for it. And some of us are born with the gift of it and some of us must chase it everywhere. And if you attempt to tie it down, it will wither. And if you set a trap for it, it will evade you. And if you use it without replenishing it, it will retreat. And if you think it costs nothing to have, all your hair will be burned off. That's the end of that quote. Yes, there is something, there is nothing, there is nothing scientific about that. These are metaphors. It is folklore that tells us that human beings have been trying to understand this concept for a while. More contemporary thinkers have been talking about something similar, the concept of authenticity. Like Duende, authenticity is not about technique, it's about uniqueness. It's like a flowering, like a flowering of our true selves that is awe-inspiring to watch. Duende doesn't live in the surface. To find it, we must travel into the depth of our humanity. But this culture distracts us too much. And many of us are living simply scratching the surface of life. I believe that when we repress our fullness, our wholeness, our pain, our sorrow, our disappointment, we also repress our creativity, free expression. We repress our duende. The popular researcher Brene Brown, who has done decades of research on authenticity, vulnerability, and shame, says that you cannot numb selectively, that when we numb hard feelings, we also numb joy, we numb gratitude, we numb happiness. Her work is important for many different reasons, but I find it very useful when applied through the lens of Duende work. Her work in vulnerability and shame in particular, because the reason why many of us are not able to fully express our Duende is because putting ourselves out there is terrifying. I mean, just raising your hand in a meeting, in a group of people, for most people, is hard. And the bigger the group, the harder it is to raise our hand. We worry that we're going to say something silly, that others are going to laugh, that we're not going to say something smart enough. And yes, the larger the group, the harder it is to even raise our hands. So now imagine putting your creations out there, the deepest, most beloved things inside your core, putting them out there. Vulnerability feels a little bit like death. And some of us have been so rejected for so long that that pain of rejection is excruciating. And so it makes perfect sense that we don't put ourselves out there more. But then we find ourselves living out of alignment with who we are truly on the inside. It's, a, it's, it's as if we're living two lives, the inner life of the soul and this other outer life that doesn't look at all like our inner lives. And at some point we begin to realize what I slowly, slowly began to realize at 17, that there is a part inside of us, like the women in the house of Bernarda Alba, that is longing for air and sunlight. And hopefully, hopefully then, when you make that realization, we also make a decision to no longer betray ourselves, our true selves. And we choose the path of authenticity, the path, the path of duende, this essential piece of our humanity, which we somehow abandoned along the way. And when we express our true selves fully, openly, we give other people permission to do the same. This is what Lorca did for me and for many others, including Leonard Cohen, 
the Canadian singer-songwriter, receiving an award in Spain for his duende, Leonard Cohen said this about Lorca. As an adolescent, I hungered for a voice. I studied the English poets and I knew their work well and I copied their styles, but I could not find a voice. It was only when I read, even in translation, the works of Lorca that I understood that there was a voice. It is not that I copied his voice, I would not dare, but he gave me permission to find a voice, to locate a voice, to locate a self, a self that is not fixed, a self that struggles for its own existence. What Lorca did for Leonard Cohen and for me is what each of us can do for one another. When we express the particularities of our individual lives, we express something universal that connects us all at the core of our shared humanity. And beloved, that is it for today. That is the end of that story. And here is my wish for you. May you call on your duende daily, which is the wind that blows soul into the faces of the listeners. May you call on your duende, the wind that blows soul into the faces of the listeners. Please join me now in singing our closing hymn, Love Will Guide Us. join me in saying our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs>